All right, and now we're recording. So let me just say a quick introduction. So today is July 1st, and we're talking about the Facebook Dilemma, the frontline documentary that was um, published in two parts, first in October and then re-aired in December. So today we have Renee, Joss, and Pam, and all of us are here in Rhode Island, which is pretty weird for me. <laughs> <laughs> and happy for us. And happy for all of us. I'm really stoked to be here. And the weather is amazing. So yeah, it's, it's a good day. Um, it's actually a really great, appropriate first day in Rhode Island, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, we just started talking just a little bit about the contents of the site. So um, Pam, do you want to say a little bit more about what you found on the front line? Yeah, I, I, uh, I watched the two episodes, which... Um were disturbing and um, enlightening. And um, then I wanted to know a little bit more. So just this morning, I um, jumped into the individual interviews. So all of the edited interviews that they have with Facebook, former employees and current employees and others are um, on the site with the full interview in their attempt at transparency, which I find interesting uh, from a media literacy perspective um, in general that uh, a news um, outlet like PBS and Frontline are taking transparency seriously and doing something with it on their website. So that's yes, I, that, that um, point about transparency for media organizations is really emerging as one of the, oh, hello, I can see you all now, <laughs> um, uh, is really uh, emerging as one of the central areas of activity and research in terms of improving trust. Um, and of course, media organizations, as we know, have uh, significant issues um, with declining trust. Yeah. Yeah, I think the uh, editing of the um, uh, documentary uh, uh, highlights um, the um, tension between the former employees who uh, have a who are freer yeah. to speak uh, and the current employees who you can see are so very careful and guarded and and that builds over the two hours so that by the time you get to the end you're really feeling like the Facebook employees are kind of in a box of their own making where they can't figure out a, a way forward because they're not literally free to think right well uh, and have and have their talking points you know given to yeah. them I mean the yeah. whole you know the mission yeah the yeah yeah the the not enough the not early enough the yeah, yeah all those and that was a very powerful build that we yeah. felt their censorship and we felt their their being controlled by the company in a very direct way It'd be interesting to go back to those interviews in their in total and see because you're right that was constructed by the editor to, yeah. to create that sensibility, it'd be interesting to see, is it present in the interviews overall? Yeah. Who was, so this is a different question. Who was the, who was the interview subject that you liked the best or least as you uh, remember watching? Any, anybody stood out to you as uh, particularly? Yeah, yeah, who was the woman um, professor? Oh, Zaytap? Zainab. Yeah. Yeah, we love Zainab. Yeah, her and next to her, Kara Swisher. Yeah, I agree. Those two were pretty amazing. Oh, look at that. And it's even transcribed. What a fant fantastic you resource. Um, Great resource. For, for me, I was um, really impressed by the work of Craig Silverman, whose mm -hmm. investigation was really central to this in the lead up to the campaign in 2016. And also to Maria Ressa, um, her uh, advocacy for truth and her vigilance um, with public interest journalism in the Philippines has been yeah. extraordinary. She, yeah. you know, as a as a um, uh, as a journalist, she's faced enormous pressure and is uh, relentless with her courage. Um, 
So I, I really enjoyed hearing her, her speak as part of this. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's those, I agree. Uh, the story of the Philippines was a really powerful um, sort of case study there. And um, I knew it, but it was a great, it was, a, it was mm. told in a very compelling way. So also the, the, case study. the Myanmar one as well with the Rohingya. Mm -hmm. And I found um, uh, Brad, whatever his name, Perskelly, whatever his name is, the Trump um, media guy. I found his in interview very interesting. Like basically him, you know, just saying, going to them and saying, you know, give me the, the, the manual. Yeah. I want to know how to get the most out of this tool. Yeah. Yeah. He spent a hundred million, a hundred million dollars. Yeah. That, that blew my mind actually. Yeah. Like turning up with a hundred million dollars and saying, you know, just make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they obviously did. Yeah. So sort of did. Um, I thought one of the observations uh, that was made by Facebook that there hadn't been criticism of Facebook before 2016 was really misleading. Um, aware that in 2014, um, and you may recall this, there was um, scrutiny of Facebook with uh, an experiment that was being conducted uh, about manipulating news feeds. There was some um, research that was being done without ethics about the uh, responses that young people would have if their news feeds were incredibly positive or negative. I remember when that was first highlighted, um, uh, for me, that was a really critical point in terms of being a consumer, um, but also too in terms of being a journalist and a researcher, I knew that, um, you know, we we're on the brink of something big. What a great observation, Josh. That is a, an excellent example of a, this was a two hour documentary, but that is an important omission. The Facebook emotional contagion story yes. was for many of us the first time we understood what the algorithm could do. Mm. Right? That the algorithm could be used to suppress or elevate content um, intentionally and strategically to have an effect on uh, audiences. And so it, it does make you wonder why that, because you're right, for many of us, that was our first uh, sort of introduction. When did that happen? And was that 2014, did you yeah, say? Yeah, I believe so. Yep. I'm pretty sure we'll have to check it. But um, I just remember then um, thinking to myself, right, you know, would you go to the butcher and buy rotten meat? <laughs> right. And of course, I remember lots of academics defending Facebook on that study, including some of our media literacy friends, right, saying, well, you know, that's, you know, that's their business model and it's an editorial freedom, right? So that's, an, a, 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 that's another point I wanted to make. I did feel like I could use bits of this um, documentary to um, address the two... Um, the two legal paradigms that are now potentially operating is Facebook a platform regulated by section 230 of the CDA, or is it a publisher regulated by the First Amendment, right? And right now it is really clear Facebook wants and all the social media want both, right? <laughs> they want both the lack of responsibility of the, from the CDA where, they're, where they have no legal liability for any harmful anything and they want all the privileges of the First Amendment with none of the responsibilities. Right. Right. And so I feel like it, it would be possible to create, to pull clips together and create that chart paradigm to show those two legal options. Because if they're that and antitrust, those are the three strategies we have, right? Regulate them like a platform, regulate them like a publisher, or break them up. Yeah. Right, and I think they did a pretty good job of uh, editing that in the thing where they showed, you know, Zuckerberg on stage when he got that question about, "Are you an editor?" and he said, "No, we're a tech company. We're not a media company." Mm -hmm. And then it immediately kind of goes into the whole thing about where they realize that they're becoming the major news source for people, and 
how are we leveraging that? So, you know, it, it's almost like them arguing with themselves about that. Right. And while we're all traveling from our various um, uh, destinations uh, post NAMLI, um, there was quite a significant development at the G20, whereas Australia actually um, got united support for controls for Facebook in the wake of what's known as the Christchurch agreement into live streaming. Um, and, you know, I think that's, uh, in terms of really broad terms, a very significant development mm. uh, in terms of mechanisms of governance, really, um, albeit, you know, reactive and not proactive. Um, but I think, you know, this is a really evolving area that, um, you know, while distribution of media has transformed so dramatically and consequently models of journalism are evolving so quickly, you know, societal responses and controls of both are really being redefined. So help me understand that more. So did Australia get permission to control live streaming? In uh, yeah, there was, there was actually a unilateral um, agreement um, to, I, I, I'm not actually right into the details, but um, I think it was only announced a day ago mm -hmm. um, that there was political support for controls on Facebook um, and other media organisations in relation to live streaming. And Great. if, you know, if it's proliferating, um, you know, that the, there are consequences. So right. I think Facebook has actually um, responded um, and had actually before this G20 announcement um, with a strong of awareness that it needs to do better and, um, and certainly um, a reluctance. So, you know, a, sorry, a, a, an interest in doing better. So I think there's currently a lot of scrambling around about technically how that's going to come to pass. Right. Sure, sure, sure. It does seem to me that uh, Facebook is probably, and Facebook and all the social media companies are starting to realize that they would, re it, having governments regulate them is probably better than them trying to be, you know, the big brother uh, making the decisions about what people see and don't see. That in the long run, government is the appropriate uh, intermediary on that and not, you know, and not them making decisions um, like you said, on a really reactive basis. We've seen the video of that. There was a really great radio lab that um, I think it was uh, maybe last spring that was published that went into Facebook's efforts to police their own content. And they talked to some of the people that they've hired in various countries because like one of the problems of Facebook, especially in countries like Myanmar, for example, um, translating Burmese is really difficult, right? Like logistically it's difficult it's a really difficult language and even if you can translate it word for word it's such a poetic language that you actually really can't derive meaning from direct translations oh. so in those kinds of countries um they well less so in myanmar actually but like in the philippines for example they've set up these um you know quality control groups that go through and monitor the flagged content to determine whether or not it should be published right and so they interview these people about their training about their pay and about how they actually make these decisions and one woman in particular really described her religious values this is a woman from the philippines and how her religious values purposefully over overrule the training that she received from facebook on what should and shouldn't be censored so it's really, um, you know, in some areas, they just clearly aren't doing enough. I, I worked a little bit in Myanmar and talked to several people there that try, have been trying for years to, um, you know, advocate or lobby to Facebook to do something. And, you know, they, the, the closest headquarters for a long time was in Singapore, which is very removed from uh, Myanmar. And it was like pulling teeth, they said, to like get them to even recognize that there is an issue. So uh, it really, so when I was watching this documentary, you know, in the very beginning, you, we see Mark Zuckerberg as a child, basically, right? He's very, um, very young, very bro, you know, um, not poised at all. And you can see through these interviews, him like 
making this transition into like a Steve Jobs type, right? Like he becomes, he stands up straight, his posture, his manner, mannerisms, how he speaks is clearly very trained. And it, it, it kind of infuriates me that he's clearly put a lot of effort and intention into this, um, into training to become this presence and this leader and this, you know, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> but yet there's so many social and, you know, media lessons that he could and should have been focusing on that no one, you know, uh, I don't know. It's, it's quite dangerous. This really highlights the danger to me. I, like this has kind of always been my way of thinking, but this documentary really showed that sociology and media studies should be mandatory for everyone, especially computer programmers. <laughs> <laughs> Who are the least likely to get media literacy exactly. of any of the uh, uh, undergraduate majors. Uh, it's an interesting point that you talk about how the um, viewer is likely to be sympathetic with Mark Zuckerberg ha watching this two hour uh, documentary because of the way we see him growing up, right, with these challenges. That was a, that was a strategy, right? That was a editorial strategy on the part of the producers to um, uh, balance the criticism with this, uh, you know, sort of uh, very humble way of, you know, watching him, watching him learn how to be uh, the, the, the richest and most important uh, media mogul ever. That's interesting because I did not feel that way, but you're right, most people probably do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on, we've already saw a feature movie made about the guy. Yeah. Right? I mean, the, uh, most of my undergraduates worship him. They, they have a lot of sympathy for him. They love him, right? And his quirks and weirdness is part of the, um, Part of the thing, although while so I want to go back uh, uh, to a point you made about the content moderation thing, just to say there is a great resource if you haven't seen it. Uh, the um, uh, point of view people uh, it aired in this in the fall last fall. It's called the Cleaners, and it's a documentary about the content moderators and the post traumatic stress syndrome that they experience. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's one of the things that's really nice is there's a quiz where you can take the uh, you can you can decide would you delete or ignore and you can sort of apply the Facebook policies to content and try to practice, try to guess what they actually decided. And what's really interesting and I want to I'm going to try to use this with my students this fall. So this quiz is going to show you how ludicrous and stupid the Facebook policies are. And that's what the quiz is going to show you. But there's another quiz. Renee, in your um, Times quiz, hold on just a sec. The New York Times quiz, which is just focused around hate speech. How does Facebook define hate speech? And here, you're going to have the same kind of quiz, which you're, there's the rules, and now you're going to decide, does, does this fit the criteria? If I, and, then, and then you see just the point you made, uh, Sam, that it is absolutely impossible to keep your values out of, uh, you can't just apply the policy because there's so much situation and context, it's not possible. Um, but then you also feel a lot more sympathy for Facebook trying to move through this process, recognizing how deeply subjective uh, it inevitably is. I think, um, you know, in broad terms too, that this is sort of learning from history, um, that, you know, that ethics and cognitive mechanisms and social configurations around technology are only really being realized now. Um, and I think that, you know, again, in broad terms, actually points to the importance of interdisciplinary research in this space. You know, some of the um, excellent work done by um, anthropologist Genevieve Bell, for example, um, observing because, you know, the people who have built these um, social media uh, technologies and companies 
a, a, a tech orientated, you know, sort of, we can't actually understand everything. So there's, um, you know, importance. And I think that uh, companies certainly have, are now um, more aware of that. And interestingly, Renee, with that quiz, I'd be interested to see a more updated version. I think Facebook's pro probably smarter in the space about what is hate speech. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, training algorithms, um, you know, Google, Facebook, uh, picking up certain images and certain words um, as well as having, you know, thousands of checkers, human checkers, there's also computer checkers, which of course is still a fallible um, environment as Christchurch showed us. But, um, you know, certainly within the past two years, as I'm aware, there's been an enormous level of activity and investment in that space in moderation. Mm. Yeah, true. Renee, can I ask in your detailed notes whether you have written down when that um, that panic attack on air happened? What year was that? Oh, okay. Let me see if I can find that. Hold on just a sec. Yeah, that was fascinating, wasn't it? It was, and I'd just love to see where on the timeline that was where he obviously was feeling pretty put upon with some of those probing questions. Cara, it's, it's it, it, in the Cara. Yeah. So about 50 minutes into episode one. So that would have been er pretty early. Oh, he had the flu. Part, part five. Yeah. So that would be, I did, I, I made notes about every 10. So each part is about 10 minutes. So yeah. that would be about 50 minutes into episode one. Yeah, yeah, that was fascinating, right? His sweaty panic attack. And and also that this, it, it, at that time, he had this unproblematic idea, give us everything, we give you free stuff. Yeah. So clearly he's got a more nuanced perspective now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, from my perspective specifically, the age factor of everyone in this thing was just like, oh my God, it's preschool over there. You know, it it, it was, wow, I, there wasn't anybody like, you know, <laughs> it felt like the, you know, don't trust anybody over 30 days again. Yeah. And that was my generation that said that. <laughs> hey, somebody who's who really gets off the hook in this episode. Yeah. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah. She had a good lawyer, I think. I think she's got the best lawyer. <laughs> so she was presented very uh, uh, obliquely. Yeah, yeah, hardly at all. When she's the architect of the business model, uh, and she was the one who figured out all, all the ways to sell to the data brokers and to let the data brokers have everything, right? But she's not depicted as the villain. So what's your thoughts about that? How come Sheryl Sandberg is not demonized or at least not even interviewed or so? Not much footage of her like there is of Mark, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's because because the company is so friggin' profitable that Wall Street loves her, right? So she is the darling of the you know the American economy right now. It's right? not just Wall Street. So I I I basically ran digital communications for a nonprofit in San Francisco between 2011 and 2015, and Cheryl Sandberg was like her book had just come out lean in you could not go anywhere you couldn't ride the train without someone asking you if you'd read it like everyone just really especially women because she's such a prominent figure and that's so unusual in silicon valley she's just kind of untouchable in that way mm. Mm. intriguing <laughs> huh well, so we should we, we talk a little bit about how would you teach about this? Uh, yeah. How would you use this documentary? This is a very intimidating documentary because it's two hours. Also, because it's historical, it covers a lot of ground. I started thinking about how overwhelming 
it what it was to watch and how you know I lived through all of this and am an expert on this topic and you know I had to take ten pages of notes right yeah <laughs> so I'm um, wondering how to do this with younger how to move through this these ideas with younger people I I actually think not getting too much into the detail I think you know a rough summary of activity but my one of my reflections from Namli was just the importance of actually starting with the now in terms of um, audience behaviours and, um, you know, and, and also to sort of output and issues with social media and media distribution more broadly. I think, you know, starting with the now and, and, um, and then working into some of the issues. I think that um, there is so much in this space um, and much of it, um, you know, is lived by people according to their various age, demographic, media behaviours. So we all come to it a little expert on something. Um, but, yeah, I think the very big challenge uh, in terms of teaching and certainly for teachers of this to frame is actually making sure that it's contemporary. Mm. Mm. But see, that's really complicated. So here we are about to uh, come into the presidential election in 2020. And I've been thinking, okay, so how do I teach students or what do we say about the Russian election interference of 2016, right? Yeah. Because you're right, it is important to be contemporary, but yeah. that's the recent past, right? That's right. So could we use a se that segment, the the segment about the internet research agency, the segment about the, uh, and, and, and to what end? And to like, so. So, so this, is, this is history. This is the tech industry first being called on its responsibility to the greater society, rather than just as a company that needs to be concerned about its bottom line. And what relevance does that have for the next Facebook, you know, or for whatever they're using your students for where they're getting their major news sources from? Which I is mean, Instagram. I see it as a historical text. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. So, so unaddressed in this documentary is uh, Sam, uh, Sam something you just suggested which is okay so now we if we were going to make this today we would probably want to add on influencers right and we'd probably want to address more about sponsored content and we might want to say something about uh, you know other bad actors who are finding ways you know to move content through social media um, well, that's even like secondary to what my point was like, so, you know, young people are moving to Instagram, which is also a Facebook company, right? And Instagram is becoming way more influential to young people. And, you know, as we heard, you know, on the panel at the, uh, namely the PBS, um, students, you know, they get their information from Instagram. So do my students in Hong Kong. So we kind of need to shift from Facebook, well, we don't need to shift, but we also need to think about how young people are using Instagram to find information. And frankly, when you look at news organizations and their use of um, Instagram, it's not even clear that they have a news-driven um, strategy for how they're using it. I think, and I know actually from talking to some people who um, manage Instagram for news organizations that they don't have a strategy. They just kind of put things up that they think will, will work. Um, so if news, if young people are getting their content, news content from news organizations who are not using Instagram strategically to deliver news, what does that mean? Mm. <laughs> I think also too, like, you know, um, like the rise of TikTok is really huge with younger demographics too. Yeah. And that, that, you know, needs to be uh, explored. And I think, you know, those short videos, I, um, I'm aware of its growth. I'm not aware of issues, but certainly, you know, there's lots of opportunities and creatively that's, there's a real shift, particularly in Asia towards TikTok. Who owns them? Um, I think Alibaba. Bite, bite yeah. Dance. So yeah, Bite Dance. 
I tried to make a couple of TikToks just to see how it worked. And I uh, appreciated how it seems like the topic for media literacy is really about issues of representation and stereotypes because the medium uh, yes. certainly would demand that you use uh, stereotypes almost, right? That it, it really is structured in such a way where that's how you'll get attention, stereotypes and um, self-sexualization. Those two themes would be how I would approach TikTok. I, 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 I can't wrap my head around how it might be used for news or how political opinion might get expressed through TikTok. That would be an interesting thing to see if students could figure that out. And I'm not even sure, how is political opinion expressed on Instagram? Yeah, well, I guess people mo mobilize around issues. So an interesting um, piece of research there would be the climate change rallies, for example, um, you know, that were, were sort of led out of Europe and, you know, certainly in our part of the world have become a really strong um, use point of mobilization on, right. on, on uh, youth orientated platforms in terms of, you know, um, connecting on, on a very important political issue. Right. And, you know, that's translated into rallies and content sharing. And so, you know, it's political. <laughs> Right. So that actually, that could be a fun project, Josh, because it would be a nice lesson plan for the propaganda website to do something like activists and Instagram as political propaganda, as activist propaganda, and look at the positive ways in which activists are engaging youth audiences through Instagram. Mm. And then look at the way in which some of those, uh, you know, like PETA is notorious for like crossing mm. all kinds of ethical <laughs> boundaries right around their activism right so and my guess is there might be some nuances there within any political community including climate change or me too or whatever right hmm. Hmm. so can i ask you all um after watching this documentary do you think you will change how you use facebook at all <laughs> what a moment. <laughs> um, I, I, th I think probably my own consumption is something, um, uh, no, not in the wake of this. I, I, I've probably made measures. And I think, I think one of the really important lessons and reminders, this documentary and everything we use, is, is just that as, a, as individuals, we do actually have power. Um, and, you know, in terms of understanding settings um, and you know the Google content that was distributed has some really good has anyone had a chance to have a look at the book that came in your swag bag at yeah. the conference there's some really really interesting practical tips about you can actually have choice um, and I think it's that message that is probably really central in terms of media literacy education Mm -hmm. Pam, what about you? Is this going to well, change? I was, I was very happy that at the end they find somebody finally mentioned the you know yeah, but it's where all my friends and and uh, you know family lives. And I, I mean, I've watched friends of mine as the scandals unfolded peel off, you know, and are just not there anymore. But for me, it is the only communication channel I have at the moment for all of my international uh, colleagues and friends and some family members that I wouldn't norm otherwise have connection with. So, yeah, I think I will def, you know, I have been and probably will more be cognizant of how I'm using it. Um, uh, I don't think I'm somebody that was put into those Russian bot groups that is going to be very vulnerable for um, thing. And I call them out all the time among my left leaning friends where it's like, you know, don't, don't believe the hype, don't fall for this. You know, we're just as vulnerable as everybody else. Um, but, uh, but I'm not ready to get it off yet. 
Okay, so that's, thank you so much for sharing that. So I also, uh, the documentary didn't change my ideas about Facebook, but I had an experience that's relevant to this discussion that I want to share with you because it did change my attitude. Um, and I wrote about it as part of my getting, you know, back, getting back on the plane and getting, you know, out of namely because um, I realized that my, um, my philosophy has really changed. So when I decided, when I decided to uh, get involved with the Move On um, Act to Defend Democracy, I uh, organized a rally in Newport, right? And I promoted it on my Facebook page and I promoted it on my Twitter. I said, join me on, you know, whatever day it was at one o'clock. And um, about a week before the event, I sort of said, well, you know, like, I don't know that many, I've been only living in Rhode Island for like what, seven years or eight, six years, something like that. So it's like, my network is not strong Rhode Island wise. So I thought, okay, I know what I'll do. I'll buy some advertising, right? To let people in Providence know about my event because I, my event was the only Rhode Island event for this particular day, the Act to Defend Democracy Day. So I go to Facebook advertising and I, 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 I make my little event into a, I wanna buy, you know, thousands of Providence people who are Democrats, right? I, I tried to, and it says, my ad was rejected. My ad was rejected. And I was like, holy shit, my ad was rejected? Well, guess what I didn't know? Now the company has special policies. And when you advertise an event, like come to the rally in Newport, you are not just Renee Hobbs, the Facebook user, you have become a political entity. And now you have to register in a special way. So I was told, no, you can't run your ad because it's political advertising. And in order to do that, we they're gonna mail, they're gonna mail something to my house, and I have to type in a special code saying I got the mailing to prove that I live in the United States. And I needed to provide a digital copy of my passport to Facebook in a certain exact format, just the right way with three inches of black showing all around. And I actually couldn't do that. Like I couldn't, There, I, I tried to submit my passport and it rejected it. And then I tried a different way to submit my passport and they rejected it. And then I was like, fuck this, right? So like I, whatever I'm doing, taking the picture of my passport, it was not coming out right. So I gave up and I did understand that they put those policies in place for a very good reason. But then I also realized that I was not able to fully exploit the power of social media for civic action, right? And I didn't even know those rules were in place, right? And so I started thinking a lot about how, you know, educators are not gonna help uh, students be self-governing citizens if they themselves don't understand how the game is played. And that's, uh -huh. that's on me, right? That's on me. Well, no, that's, the, that's the big challenge, isn't there, about contemporary responses, contemporary education. Um, you know, that often those sort of things aren't discovered until they're tested. Yeah, <laughs> it's right. And it's partly about your point about we have to be living in the now. We have to be teaching the now, yeah. <laughs> right? So I have two thoughts about that. One is, and again, being someone who used to, you know, work very closely with Facebook, um, they don't make it transparent when they make these kinds of changes, when their algorithms change, when their policies change, when your options as a user change, they don't actually communicate that. So it's not, I mean, even if you're a practitioner and you are actively working on Facebook on a daily basis, this kind of stuff surprises you too. Um, and you find out the hard way. My second point is that- So you're saying I don't have to feel guilty that no, I'm not in the loop. No, no, I'm very good at shifting the blame to Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but that, that, that was my experience too, even as a practitioner that, you know, so. Um, my second point is, so just like what happened to you, Renee, 
all of these smaller organizations that Mark Zuckerberg is trying to pull together and give voice to, they're, they're likely to have the same experience, right? And to have the same outcome, which is that they don't actually have a voice in that way on Facebook. Whereas larger organizations with more resources and potentially more connections um, are, much, are much better set up to navigate these kinds of changes and to take advantage of you know, the platform over smaller people with less time, less you know, expertise, that kind of thing. So um, I think it's quite dangerous actually because it's just going to give you know, the, the, those with bigger resources the bigger voice. Whoa, great point. Yeah, that's an interesting observation. Certainly uh, it was pretty humbling for me to realize that uh, I couldn't exercise my uh, political, identity in Facebook without jumping through these hoops. And um, I understand now that the lack of those hoops is what caused the abuses. Um, but I also feel like I wonder how many other people will foreclose upon aspects of their civic identity because of these um, these limited, these challenges, these new structures that are in place. And you're right that little tiny, small independent operators are going to be the underrepresented voices and big organizations are going to, but even, even move on could have told me, I mean, that's yeah. another thing. So they're also, I guess in the great scheme, they're also a small player. Yeah. yeah. Okay, because yeah. they didn't have the resources to explain to me in the in the user guide because I got a user guide on how to hold a how to hold a rally, right? <laughs> well, I mean, even oh, if cool. that was created three months ago, six exactly. months ago, it's outdated. <laughs> yeah, so the Facebook dilemma when it comes to civic agency is likely to be quite dynamic over this next political process. So maybe that's the secret. Maybe teaching the now with when it comes to Facebook and social responsibility is simply my students have to read the New York Times every day. Right? And we just have to be following what's going on with New York Times, what's going on with Facebook day to day. Right? Um, the, the, the platforms in, you know, in partly in response to um, concern and potential market loss through, you know, what's perceived as poor behaviours do actually have some really active responses. And I know that um, certainly Facebook in um, Australia does hold um, education rallies for communities. Um, so, you know, in terms of actually uh, explaining, educating how people can actually utilise the platform effectively for their business or their civic interests. I don't know how widespread that is here, but I know that that has actually sort of really evolved in the past 18 months. Thanks and to Trump's, tr thanks to Trump's media guy. Yeah, yeah and <laughs> Google, Google as well. But, you know, like a, a sort of a real outreach, um, educative focus about their platforms. And you can be cynical about it, but it's also useful. Yeah. Sure. So I think I, they came to Rhode Island. I think they, oh no, that was Google. Uh, Google came to, uh, Google came to Rhode Island for three days and did some like kind of open training sessions, but I haven't seen Facebook here. So I was um, just driving through the Bible Belt um, on one of my several road trips over the last couple of weeks. And I happened upon a radio station um, that was a religious radio station. And I heard the word Facebook and I was like, oh, I should listen to this. So I listened to it for about 15, 20 minutes. And it was a specialist from Facebook who works specifically in religious community organizing. Right. And she goes to religious communities and helps them understand how one, they can use the existing tools to further their proselytization, <laughs> And two, how Facebook can help them build tools to further enhance that. So- wow. That was new to me. <laughs> Holy! I definitely, um, you know, I thought about all of this when I did my first ad for Media Literacy Now Rhode Island. And ever since then, have been asked by Facebook to up my ads and do my ads. <laughs> and, you know, I... Oh, we've lost audio. Pam, yep. 
Can you hear us? Put your, you, did you mute your microphone? Plug in your microphone. What happened there? Uh, it looks like, like oh. Uh oh, did she freeze? No, she's working. Talk, talk, use, use your. <laughs> Wait, I can't hear oh, you. No. She's not muted. Weird. Oh shit. So yeah, so that was the middle of a good story there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> Yeah, I got um, an idea, Pam. Uh, uh, leave and then come back in. Yeah, okay. Oh, oh, wait, oh wait, there she is. Now you're back. Yeah. Talk. Okay. Now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the, the, the upshot was I just, it, I, it hit me at that moment that anybody who has a lot of money can send these ads out to billions of people and those of us that don't have so much resources. So once again, you know, money talks. Uh, so I'm glad to hear that they're doing those kind of how to get your message out. But, you know, it also still comes down to, in many cases, how much money do you have to spend to get your message so out? So that does bring us back to the PBS Facebook dilemma, which sidestepped completely. The economic. To our episode, the business model built on advertising, because it didn't have to be that way. Yeah. Okay. There were other business models they could have used. There were other ways it could have been done, but reproducing the ad driven uh, uh, revenue stream has inevitable consequences to empower the powerful. And that was not problematized, ironically, even by our public broadcaster. It was mentioned a couple of times, but um, yeah. I mean, the whole Cambridge Analytica piece, mm -hmm. that was, you know, sort of um, at least a hinting at it with the, when the whole data um, mining, data brokers right. piece right. came in. But, but they didn't have somebody like who might have a more critical perspective on um, surveillance capitalism like yeah. Shoshana Zuboff, right? Whose book, Surveillance Capitalism, says, you know, think about the, think about the business model that, you know, uh, harvests data for personalized advertising to uh, basically continue to, uh, to get their messages into your consciousness and influence your behavior and attitudes. So there was not a person that we would consider critical of capitalism on the show right right so that so that so that um and and the ad revenue as a means to pay for media is maybe so normative you know why should the show critique it when that really wasn't part of the, it it did a kind of a crisp linear summary it, you know maybe that hasn't really happened yet right we, we haven't seen people critique ad-driven media. Why? Because we get all this shit for free, just like Mark Zuckerberg said. Right. Right? It's a small price to pay. Today's New York Times says your data is only worth $240 a year anyway. Online. That's all. So, hmm. you know, that's a couple of dinners in Newport, really, you know? <laughs> <laughs> No. All right, that was fun. That was a good conversation. Uh, uh, it, thanks to the Rhode Island uh, ladies for making it uh, was. Yeah. What are we gonna do next? Yeah, so um, I am going to put some information here in the chat box. Uh, our next conversation is going to be August 5th, I think. Let me double check. Uh, yes, August 5th. And there is a link. Um, two links here. Um, one is to vote for the next title as always. So we have three, three new selections this month. And then we have a new um, form that I think Michael introduced it last month. But basically, instead of asking people to go to the spreadsheet and navigate tabs for different types of content, um, we just created a form that allows people to just simply put in the title, select the type of content, you know, blah, 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 basically fill out the, the um, 
the column fields by form instead. So please distribute that and encourage people to submit new, um, new content ideas because we're running short, especially of audio, uh, podcasts, et cetera. Um, we still have plenty of, well, we still have some books, but anything you guys want to recommend or if you hear of something interesting, encourage other people to uh, use the form to quickly and easily recommend as well. And that's it. Thank oh, cool. you. Wait, when do you get back to, should we stop the recording now and have a social chat? Yeah, that sounds great. So <laughs> thank you, ladies, and thank see you in August. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was excellent, Sam. Oh. Joss, you're, 